Local minima, the problem of finding a good solution first and then focusing on optimizing this good solution rather than the truly optimal one. Since 2009, the Diablo 2 speedrunning community had embraced the Assassin as the fastest character. A combination of burst of speed and wake of fire giving her a low barrier to entry and great speedrun times with little practice. With the ability to teleport, it seemed the sorcerer should be faster, but having to wait until level 18 was too slow for the nascent community. But was the Assassin's domination of the leaderboards inevitable? With the growth of the community throughout 2015, it was only a matter of time until a mixture of collaboration, incentives, and belief in a better way unearthed the true fastest character in Diablo 2, taking things well beyond what was thought possible at the dawn of D2 speedruns. So, it begins. Come on a journey of the Sorceress's domination of the Players 1 leaderboards, where continuous innovation and iteration would force times ever lower, driven by those unafraid to push the boundaries in the pursuit of the premier Diablo 2 world record. The very day Lav posted his first real-time attack assassin run, there was speculation that the sorceress would be faster, but for the first two years the assassin had held strong. In late 2015 came the sorceress's time to shine. As mentioned in the class comparisons in part 1, the sorceress is an incredibly technical character to run. Due to the glass cannon nature of the class, she is liable to dying and either wasting time recovering from that death, or in the case of hardcore purists, ending a run entirely. But most importantly, until unlocking Teleport at level 18, she's just a slow character to run. Her early level skills are moderately powerful at best, and usually require stopping and directly engaging with monster groups, with lots of positioning and weaving being critical to handling mobs. Compare this to a class like the Assassin or Druid, who can run, cast a spell once to kill a reasonably sized mob, and quickly keep running to progress through the map. The Sorceress requires an entirely different mindset, one pursuing experience over progress. It would take a long time for runners to realize this was the strategy at all, and as with so many disruptive innovations, it first emerged coincidentally and as the result of more eyes making shallow work. By the time 2015 rolled around, the general strategy on gear to have and skills to use was pretty much bettered down. Make sure you had stealth and fire resistance gear, and start specking early game into charge bolt and then respec at level 13 into Static and Nova. As a well-established game, even subtle micro-optimizations like knowing what to pick up for gold or inventory teleporting were well documented. The main focus of the community was on how to execute better, how to effectively herd packs, how to teleport safely without dying, and how to read maps even more effectively so you could recognize dead ends early. Throughout 2015, the growth of the Diablo 2 speedrunning community expanded and with runners like Ryu Kezakotl, Mr. Lama SC and Teo all averaging multiple hours per day on top of the existing streamers like Nightfall and Indrek, these minor optimizations started to point towards the overall optimal strategy, but it would take some time to get there. On the 4th of April 2015, Teo would smash Nightfall's previous Sorceress World Record, bringing the class-specific Sorceress World Record time down from 1.41.58 to 1.28.05, within three minutes of his astonishing assassin time. For the next few months, categories would be further fleshed out, especially hell runs, and then in September, the gauntlet was thrown down. There is a bounty of $150 on the one's uh, 25 run. So the four, uh, it's in this month. The community, and Teo especially, got to work. Knowing the extreme amounts of luck involved in his assassin time, he quickly decided that the sorceress was the only realistic path forward in meeting this challenge, and it was only a couple of days trying before a run really started coming together, with a waypoint right next to the Forgotten Tower in Act 1. Over the course of 2015, the community had realised the Forgotten Tower hosting the Countess was good for more than just runes in the early game, and this was an area heavily exploited in the rise of the sorceress. First of all, it was likely to drop other useful items along the way, like rings or amulets with a faster cast rate affix, making dealing damage and teleporting much faster and safer in the later game. It was also common to find open socket shields and chip topazes, 
which could be used for lightning resistance. Not to mention that otherwise useless runes could often either be directly helpful, like tier runes to save on mana costs or rail runes for fire resistance, but could also be sold for gold to support the sorceress's crippling mana addiction. But perhaps most importantly, the tower is relatively quick to run through and more than 90% of the time will have at least one unique mob on each of those five levels, allowing runners to exploit that sweet, sweet 500% XP bonus for every boss and minion killed in the mob. Based on all of these, Teo continued farming the tower until he hit level 13 before pushing ahead to later areas of the game. With some good momentum already, the run really picked up pace with an extremely fortuitous drop a few minutes later in the jails. The unique Heavy Boots Gorefoots grant 20% faster run walk and gave him a much needed speed boost in the early game. But while the gear was good, as the run progressed the game got less and less kind. There were commonly long distances between entrance and exits in the map layouts, a very unlucky 4th way arcane sanctuary and no great marsh skip. Not to mention, he also had a very tough fight with Andariel, hindering his planned use of static, and an absolutely brutal number of deaths fighting Diablo. In all, as he closed in on Bale in the Worldstone Keep, his chances of getting that sub-125 bounty were looking tight. Ultimately, he couldn't do it. Teo finished the run deflated, despite setting a world record and beating his own assassin record, he was still 34 seconds short. Um, okay, thanks, Sherry. <laughs> so the next day, he got up and did it again. He beat the previous day's time by a whole 6 seconds and brought the record down to 125.27. And so, he kept trying. Run after run after run over the course of the next two weeks would see the record brought down not just below the 125 goal, but drastically below it. And then, further still, and then, after kindly giving the rest of the speedrunning community a chance to catch their breath for a few months, to ring in 2016, on January 11, he was back, smashing the 1 hour 20 minute mark. Yes! Throughout these runs, the strategies remained largely consistent. He gave up entirely on trying to take on Andaria with Static, and otherwise it was merely a matter of optimizing playstyle, navigating monsters and maps slightly better, and grinding out better maps. Satisfied with his efforts to break the 120 barrier, Teo would move on to try and take the records in other categories and classes. After a breakthrough 3 months, it would take another 7 for a new player to emerge and challenge the new old king of Diablo speedrunning, and this challenger would have some controversy in his history. Slimo. Slimer Lake had first emerged as a personality on Twitch in one of the platform's own breakthrough moments, Twitch Plays Pokemon. Here, he heavily engaged in chat, so much so that some began to wonder how he had so much time. His entry into Diablo 2 speedrunning showed a similar commitment to the grind. With an obsession for the sorceress, he was able to quickly get up to speed with the best in class runners, and on July 16, posted this run. We did. The biggest change in this record compared to those previous was a clear knowledge of Act 2 desert tiles. You see, the deserts in Act 2 are a surprisingly large time sink in the early game. The areas are quite large and if you don't know where you're going you can spend minutes running along the edge of maps simply trying to find the exit to the next area and then even longer still trying to find the key dungeons on the map that you need to retrieve quest items from. While a more efficient method was understood and explained at least as early as 2015, in all previous records, runners had basically adhered to the strategy of hugging the outer walls. In incorporating this community knowledge of desert layouts, Slimo brought map reading to a new level. Knowing that the exits could only be close to the corners of the large square maps, he took on the learnings from within the community that every single site that didn't contain an exit would have a slight cut-in. As soon as he saw these cut-ins, Slimer would begin running to the next closest corner through the middle of the map, 
maximizing his chances of finding the necessary dungeons and minimizing wasted time exploring corners for exits which would never appear. Beyond this, there were no new special tricks nor groundbreaking new strategies. Even his maps weren't that great with a fourth way arcane sanctuary and no marsh skip in Act 3. Slimo simply played extremely well and had good fortune on his side, with decent shrine luck and high unique pack density in the early game really paying off. Not to mention dropping Blood Fist early on in the catacombs. And frankly, his act boss kills were some of the cleanest I've ever seen in Diablo speedrunning. After a brief break and skilling up in the Hell category, Slimo would continue to dominate the Sorceress leaderboards throughout 2017, with record after record after record after record after record. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, on February 2nd, 2018, Slimo posted a cryptic, self-incriminating and just weird tweet. The tweet's gone now, and this whole period of Diablo 2 speedrunning is kind of confused, but it essentially amounted to Slimo needing some space from Diablo 2, asking for all his world records to be cancelled, and vaguely hinting at cheating as some kind of preface for why they should be removed. There was no evidence of cheating ever given, and today Slimo is still part of the community, with this outburst attributed to an ill-conceived way of forcing himself to have a break from what had become an obsession. This left Teo as the world record holder across both softcore and hardcore categories, and then, after literal years of attempts at grinding, Mr. Lama SC finally secured the softcore sorceress world record on March 5, 2018. Why don't you dare screw me over? Woo! That was close. <laughs> While this was still slower than Teo's 117.12 in hardcore, it's important to note as it's the seed for a strategy that would take almost a year to come to fruition. This record had a new approach to leveling, forcing the experience shrine luck that Teo had previously shown to be so powerful by grinding for a map with shrines in early Act 1, and then save quitting routinely in order to maximize the chances of shrines spawning as experience shrines. This led to less reliance on a map with close proximity between the Black Marsh Waypoint and the Forgotten Tower, with less time spent rerunning the tower overall. Compounding this, he started farming some of the super unique monsters in Act 2. Since super uniques are guaranteed to spawn at the same location every time, and also grant the same 500% experience bonus as other unique monsters, they really help in quickly getting to level 18 and being able to use teleport much earlier in the game. I think this is the strat right here. I think this is the strategy. Even with this advantage, Lama still had a rough time. It took until Act 2 to really get his experience strategy paying off, and he also lost several minutes to long edge case maps, which were hard to predict, even with good reading skill. And with no resistance gear for safety, well... No! Ah, that's fine. Nope! Ah, the stupid charge bolts. It's so full. Come on. Uh huh? What? Unfortunately for Llama, this only enticed Slimo back into the hunt, and by May 2018, he was back participating in the community. First apologizing for the confusion caused by his conduct, Slimo said that his old records should not be reinstated and he would instead set entirely new ones. He was as good as his word, quickly setting a new world record and then cementing his position with an astonishing 1.12.39. Uh, 1.12.39. GG <laughs> everyone. Similar to previous records, Slimo ran his Act 2 maps extremely well and had very good Act boss fights. On top of adopting the experience shrine strategies from Llama's runs, he had better luck being able to exploit them against monster groups and didn't even end up needing the super unique farming strategies Llama had shown to achieve a phenomenal pace. With the world record now only just over two and a half minutes from sub 110, the entire speedrunning community were focused on the hunt for 69. What do you mean? It seems like race to 69 would fit better on Nudie Tuesday. No, it's Newbie Tuesday. 
newbie. From looking at Slimo's run, there were still a few clear opportunities for faster maps. He'd gotten a third way arcane and had a rough time in the Act 3 jungles, and still had the opportunity to get to level 18 faster with better monster spawns. Taking a cue from Llama's brief record during the Slimo confusion, there was some experimentation in the community around finding better locations for leveling, with the super unique monsters Beetle Burst and Dark Elder in Act 2 being particular favourites. This strategy had actually seen some success in a Player's X non-expansion run from Indrek years earlier, but until Llama's run had limited application in the Player's 1 leaderboards. However, most runners largely stuck to the existing shrine farming strategy and hoped for better luck. The new strategy would be pioneered to success from an unlikely corner. 2018 saw a number of streamers and amateurs come together for a race series hosted by Mr. Llama SC, and it was from here the community at large would get their first real view of the new challenger in their ranks. Honestly, I know so little about this game in reality. I haven't really fiddled with settings even. Working hard to improve his times and doing a phenomenal job engaging with a fledgling audience, Langsa took the primary elements from Mr. Llama's temporary 117 record and refined them to a place that would redefine the grind for Sorceress. He stripped out constantly checking shrines, deciding the time loss was not worth it if they didn't roll. He also massively pared back the time spent running the Countess, resetting his run if he didn't have the stealth runes in the first 15 minutes, which meant only one or maybe two Countess kills. Oh. Let's go. And finally, he focused entirely on getting a good map layout in the far oasis in Act 2, close to the super unique Beetle Burst, so we could constantly save and quit and kill him again and again until unlocking Teleport at level 18 before completing any of the Act 2 quests. In a way, this was trading off a few pieces of RNG on gear and shrines for another based solely on map layouts. But, well, on December 18th, 2018, the results spoke for themselves. Yo! Yeah! The run had a lot going for it, with everything Lagzor wanted for his strategy, plus some extra fast Act 1 maps, an amazing orb drop in the early game, and extra unique packs spawning near Beetle Burst relatively frequently. It was so close to the coveted sub-110 that had been chased for at least two years at this point. Unfortunately, there were just a couple of errors which held it back. First, Lagzor had a habit of selling items before seeing their attributes, which meant he missed out on some armor with faster hit recovery, which likely would have avoided a death early in his leveling, in the end costing him around 10 seconds. Secondly, going against his first instincts, he chose not to YOLO the Countess and actually hunt for the waypoint in the Black Marsh, costing around another 30 to 45 seconds. And finally, and most importantly, when he respected at level 18, he completely forgot that he'd purchased an armor that required 27 strength, only putting 25 stat points into this attribute. And reset after reset, vendors refused to offer the two socket armor he needed for stealth. It took more than a minute to get what he needed. The minute that would have brought him to the first sub 110 RTA run. With the Beetle Burst strategy proven, other runners flocked to the category to see if they could push it lower. The by now old hands Tao and Llama kicked into the grind, as well as new up and comers like Bender Meets Fry or Sudden Dan. It would take another three months for someone to break Lagza's record, an old hat at Diablo 2 speedrunning, the very same Indrek who'd been playing on Twitch back when Lav first started the RTA category. In the meantime, Indrek had continued as a regular Diablo streamer, putting out guides, experimenting with human bot type projects, and even grinding a sorceress to level 99 in single player. His return to the sorceress speedrunning grind had been an even bigger challenge. I want to go for another 99. On a sork. Quite badly. Honestly, it took less time than this project has taken. But on March 4th, 2019, he came through with the goods with a 110.31. Yeah! <gasps> oh. Did it, dude? Damn. <laughs> Damn. 
Similar to Lagzor, this run had some obvious time saves, most prominently an unfortunate death in Act 2. And with clear sight to that sub-110 goal, this was when the ball really started rolling. 11 days later on the 15th of March, Mr. Lamarissi would finally have a true claim to the fastest players won bail kill. Still a world record though, I'll take it. I'll take it. Woo! Oh, 10 seconds. Interesting that Lama's not going for the hardcore now. Now that he briefly has the softcore one, couple. Teo had done it, once again claiming the first to break a 10 minute barrier after his previous 136, 125 and 119, he secured the world record and the coveted 69 handle with a final time of 109.09. Despite Lama gaining a gear advantage from some faster run walk boots, as well as Teo massively struggling with gold the entire run, he had some serious luck in getting a pseudo beetle burst strategy to pay off. See, the problem runners realized when trying the Beetle Burst strategy is that because Beetle Burst always only spawns with three minions, it's really reliant on getting additional unique monster groups spawning alongside him. While Llama and Indrek had gotten additional packs of low XP itchies next to Beetle Burst, somehow Teo had lucked himself into an incredibly rare situation where there was a different reliable Beetle unique pack right next to his waypoint. And while it didn't spawn every time he tried, it commonly spawned with around 5 to 6 minions, more than making up for missing Beetle Burst himself. But a beast had been awakened, and within 3 days, Indrek would come back to smash Teo's record out of the park with a 107.54 that while many tried, no one seemed able to conquer. Not bad, not bad. Getting Beetle Burst even closer to the waypoint, as well as an extra unique mob around one third of the time, meant he powered through the experience gain. And stacked on top of this, he managed to get the critical extra faster cast rate piece, taking him beyond the 37% breakpoint, so he was flying with his teleports. Indrek would then continue with his sorceress grind, living the save, quit, delete life, and pushing the hell category beyond where previously thought reasonable, before switching to the hardcore category and pushing the normal bail kill time even lower to 107.33. Holy shit, we beat the softcore time as well in hardcore, we did it. Wow. Holy crap. In this time, many tried to conquer the world records, but none seemed capable. The grinding nature of finding that perfect beetle burst spawn wore out many a contender, and with his dominance of other sorceress categories, it seemed like something big needed to happen to take Indrek off the throne. And so it was, on the 17th of November 2019, that the former master of the sorceress, Slimo, came to reclaim his throne. <laughs> I told you that this is the world record, right? <laughs> Barely even setting up his OBS client to optimize for viewers, it took just three days of attempts for Slimo to take back the record through a combination of his old Act 1 power leveling strats exploiting experience shrines, and then layering the Beetle Burst strat on top. Even with a worse Beetle Burst spawn, the time loss to farming shrines when they didn't spawn as experienced shrines, and a horrible Tal Rash's map requiring a reset, it still wasn't enough to hold him back. The run was boosted even further by a first way arcane and a marsh skip in Act 3. In the end, it was an amazing display of Slimo's superb sorcerer skills, smashing the old record and bringing it down to 106.38. Of course, Indrek immediately stepped into the challenge. The hours of grinding on world records had made him a master at grinding runs for days on end. And five days later, he'd found a run with an even better start. Like Slimo, he managed to have experience shrines active basically the whole time until he got his runes from the Countess. 
and he didn't even have to reset multiple times to get them. Then he found a faster cast rate amulet in the tower. Then he found a beetle burst spawn even closer to the waypoint than in Slimo's run. And then he found another faster cast rate ring. The run was looking amazing. Even a second way arcane couldn't stop him from taking a lead. A rough act three saw him behind Slimo's pace, but as a pro chaos runner, he had no troubles making more gains through act four. Then act five happened. These were some of the best maps a runner could hope for, and Indrek was nailing the time. It was only when he got to the throne room that chat started to notice something wrong. With no town portals, a single wrong move could have his sorceress die, as it happened to Lagzor, Llama, Teo, and even Slimo, leaving him stranded, unable to complete the run. Could he really pull it off? I'm aware of my TP stunt very body. Of course he could. A minute and 40 seconds later, he had the record back. Sub one of five, fuck, yes, we did. <laughs> Dude, what a run, holy shit. At this point, the community was left scratching their heads. It had been months of grinding, trying to get good beetle burst setups, and the luck needed to get experience shrines on top of a close beetle burst spawn on top of getting the right runes from the countess was simply daunting. So while everyone else continued to grind beetle burst, Slimo started working out a new strategy that was simultaneously less random and yet still less probable. The magic would be gone and replaced with even more of a grind to hit level 18 even earlier and maybe, just maybe, break the one hour barrier. It was here that the jail strat would be born. The jail strategy is a power leveling technique that's exploited in the middle of act one. On top of there being tricks to navigating maps in the game from hints in the layouts of tiles, there are also a bunch of tiles which are tied to spawning unique or champion monsters. This was part of why leveling in the forgotten tower during countess runs was such a big deal in the earlier years. On top of having a defined number of unique spawns in a map area, levels in the tower could spawn with this L-shaped tile, which has about a 95% chance of force spawning an extra unique mob and granting a slew of extra experience. Similar to the L shape in the tower, the jails have two tiles which will always spawn a pack of champions, one being this jail cell and the other being this T intersection. The beauty of the jails is that Jails Level 1 has a waypoint which can spawn right next to one of these tiles, meaning save quitting and running to the tile can be extremely fast, especially if you get the waypoint directly to the south of the T intersection. But wait, Champion Packs only give 300% base monster experience and have only a couple of monsters. That's strictly worse than Beetle Burst and his minions who give 500%, right? Well, most of the time, yes. But there's an exception. Minions that spawn with champions also give 500% XP. And as luck would have it, one of the monsters that spawn in the jail are one of the few who have minions for their champion groups. Dark ones. A champion group will consistently have two to four champions and typically three to five minions will spawn with each champion when possible. So even though the base experience for dark ones is less than a third of what you get from death beetles, in the time it took to run from the waypoint to the pack, it would still end up giving slightly better XP than the Beetle Burst pack, even earlier in the game. The only trouble was, getting this layout was incredibly difficult. While the defined patterns in the jails made it much easier to navigate than the open plains of the Far Oasis, the chances of getting the champion tile in the first place were low, and getting it right next to the waypoint was an order of magnitude lower, and even then, it was only a 1 in 5 chance that it'd be the right monster type. Slimo spent months working on this strategy, but in the end, it wouldn't be him who got the first record using it. The run was on. Oh shit! I think we made my time. After getting the Dream Jail set up, Indrek also got a first way arcane in the Vaunted Marsh Skip, and coming out of the Diablo fight, things were on pace for a 58 minute run. The first record using the jail strategy was going to break that one hour mark. Coming into act five, Indrek was doing his best to keep his nerve. And then, at the Ancients fight, things started falling apart. 
Maddox had spawned with a huge amount of lightning resistance, and Indrek's attacks were only one-fifth effective, turning what should have been a 20 second fight into almost two minutes. And then, his Worldstone keep maps were awful, and Wave 3 in the Bale fight refused to cooperate. The one hour dream was gone, but even then, the Jails had proven their power in setting a new record two minutes faster than the old time. But Act 5 killed, killed, killed some time. A week later, Indrek would take the time even lower. By this point, he was willing to throw the old strategies to the wind and go back to his early days of grinding non expansion Diablo 2. There would be no stealth. Faster cast rate and hit recovery would have to come off gear that he either dropped or shopped. And even six long map rerolls weren't enough to stop him pushing it even closer to sub one hour, coming in only 40 seconds shy. Oh, nice. Nice. Perfectly on the pot scene, the end. Man. Well, improved my crappy Act 5 on this one, but not quite sub 1, unfortunately. It was only a matter of time before one hour was broken. And Slimer had one more trick up his sleeve to get him there. On the 13th of May 2020, he uploaded this record. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. GG boys. Oh shit. <laughs> Actually, it happened. <laughs> wow. Okay. It was a solid playthrough. Good gold, excellent gear. But one thing really stood out. The lack of sound. You see, Slimer had figured out that by disabling sound, which could be done through a command line input in the game load extension, it stopped the game from having to load a bunch of files associated with the soundtrack, making load times incredibly quick. This was regardless of hardware, even on a 20 year old game. And in a run where about a quarter of the time is load, waypoint, kill, repeat, these savings easily added up to a minute or more over the course of a run. And so, of course, other runners started trying this new strategy themselves to push times down even further. The trouble was, as anyone who's played Diablo would know, the masterful audio experience is a huge thing to sacrifice playing the game, and a lot of runners found their enjoyment of the game was diminished enough that they no longer wanted to play. While some pushed on and experimented with only having NS active during the leveling section, another member of the community, Wafu, quickly came up with a solution that had been implemented in many modern games. Use in-game time, or time without loads instead. This wasn't without problems, and indeed over the course of the next year, Indrek would be burned by a time in a different category that was faster than the world record in RTA, but slower in in-game time. But still, after a vote in the community, the in-game time was implemented. So, as had been done before, Indrek stepped into the grind but the time saves possible were getting harder and harder to find. It would take a solid month of playing to reclaim the world record based on the new timing system, with a time without loads of 58.14, which was a minute and a half slower than his previous RTA record. But still, these were the new rules, and nobody had bothered to go back and retime the old records to get a without loads time, so the new records stood. The trouble was, the new jail strats had pushed the grinding element of this category to the brink of runner's desire to play. It could take four hours of playing before a runner even found the right jails map, with no guarantee that the RNG for the rest of the run wouldn't kill it anyway. With other category records being more fun to play, most runners in the community would only dive in for a couple of days trying the jails before getting burned out and chasing a hell record, or an Amazon record, or starting an entirely new category. And so, this record would stay at the top the longest since Slimo's 1 hour 12 run. It would take 6 months and a new runner on the scene, 327x, while also bringing a new glitch into the limelight, wave skipping. In April 2019 during a practice run on the Amazon, Vitruth was having some trouble successfully kiting wave 4 out of the throne room. After finally giving up and just killing the monsters, he waited for wave 5 to spawn. and waited. Come on. This is silly. What is going on? 
Are you kidding me? I skipped it. I skipped Lister? What? It would take over a year of casual explorations of the cause. But in October 2020, a modern legend of Diablo speedrunning, Vendor Meets Fry, would successfully replicate it. First in the Slash Diablo engine, and then again in the unmodified version. Quickly other runners like Macro Bio Boy and Indrek jumped in and fleshed out the finer mechanics of getting a complete skip of a wave. It's a frame perfect trick which requires triggering Bale laughing, then exiting the boundary of the throne room, waiting about 6 seconds after the laugh, and then just entering the threshold of the room for a single frame before exiting again. This seemingly triggers the calculation for the AI to check the room is empty of the previous wave, increments the wave to check the subsequent wave, but doesn't give enough time to trigger the spawn procedure for that wave. Given Diablo 2 runs at 25 frames per second, this isn't quite as tricky as in some other games like Super Mario Bros. or Castlevania that run at 60 frames per second, but it's still quite challenging to successfully weave into the very end of a multi-hour run especially for something that only saves anywhere between 5 and 30 seconds per wave. For 327's run, after killing the very easy waves 1 and 2, after multiple skip attempts, he only managed to pull off a skip for wave 3. Given this wave is usually the most painful for the sorceress, with high lightning resistance making them really hard to kill, and awful movement AI making them hard to drag, this was still a win. But with the wasted time on the other two failed attempts, the benefits of wave skipping was marginal at best. But even so, he managed to edge out Indrek's record by half a minute, with a time without loads of 57.45. And with Indrek going on a multi-month hiatus, there was no one left to challenge the throne. Of course, as soon as Indrek came back in March 2021, he started the grind again. But this time wasn't so easy. It would take a full three months of grinding, switching categories, then coming back and grinding again to beat 327's time. Hold, hold, hold. First in softcore. There it is. And then taking it back to the early years of RTA speedrunning, setting the pace in hardcore just a week later with a time without loads of 56.35. And while the wave skipping technique seemed to be such a huge opportunity when first discovered, once again it failed to pay off in these runs, failing on wave three on both of them. And once you fail a wave skip, you have to either kill the wave and try again for the next skip, or give up entirely, as any monster you drag will attack you and disrupt your ability to execute the trick. What carried the run was quickly finding the perfect Jails layout with the southern waypoint spawn after only three rerolls, as well as an excellent light res and FCR amulet off Andariel, and a risky gambit of going straight into the den without shopping for stamina or mana potions paid off. Despite being the current peak performance, there still looks like there's opportunity to do better. The real time of these runs were much slower than the 1 hour 40 second run he'd set before Slimo's NS record, and unbelievably at this point, the hardcore record has both a 4th way arcane and no marsh skip. And this is where we stand today. RTA without using NS has still not broken the one hour barrier, and the time without loads method has actually moved the record further away in this sense. As more players get burned out in trying to overcome RNG, it's very similar to the early days of segmented runs in trying to find new ways of playing to minimize the pain of that randomness. Now, the player's X category, where you can better manipulate experience in a trade-off for monster health and damage, is gaining traction amongst a small group of runners, and the Hell category is more popular, amongst other experiments like Seeded, Twinked, and Battle.net style runs. And of course, with Diablo 2 resurrected launching, a lot of runners will migrate to the new platform with its own categories, thinning the field even further. The overarching narrative of Diablo 2 speedrunning is complex, and there are many stories to be told. There's the story of how methods for speedrunning evolved along with the platforms that brought audiences, with early internet encouraging short video uploads facilitating segmented runs, to Twitch instead incentivizing long-form streams and real-time attack. There's the story of how pushing the limits of what's possible requires sacrificing safety, first moving from assassin to sorceress, and then in the end ditching the foundation of the run, the stealth rune word. There's the story of the first follower effect, First with Psycho following Marshmallow and setting the segmented standard on SDA, then with Nightfall following Lav and solidifying the RTA category. 
There's the story of progress being made by creating incentives for runners gaining an audience. When Mr. Lama, Teo, and Ryu built a huge audience on Twitch, it encouraged others to come and experiment, bringing the breakthrough techniques from Slimo and Lagzor, and then encouraging Indrek away from general content streaming back into speedrunning. There are all these stories and many more, plus just genuinely entertaining content from all the runners. Come remasters, come new strategies, come new runners. Evil, beware.